All right. You're welcome back from our break. Now, looking into the aquatic habitat as the first example, we saw before now that the aquatic habitat had three divisions. We call them marine, estuarine, and freshwater. Now, the basic difference between these three types of aquatic habitats is salinity. Salinity refers to salt content, how much dissolved salt we have in the water. Now, for marine water, that's the water in the marine habitat, it is very salty. It has very high salt content. For fresh water, salt content is near zero. Now, in between these two extremes, we have the estuary. As a matter of fact, we describe the estuary habitat as where the marine and freshwater habitats meet. Where they meet or where the waters meet is what we refer to as the estuary. And um, somehow, the water in the estuary is neither here nor there. It's neither fresh water nor very salty water. Yes, there's some salt in it, but it appears to be a mixture of the two. Because actually, you have um, a portion of it close to the marine habitat, close to the sea, that is more salty than the other end that is closer to the river, to the fresh water, that has near zero salt. So the water in the marine habitat is special. So the water in the um, estuary is special. It is neither the water in the marine or the fresh water. So we call it brackish water. So when you hear brackish water, yes, sort of um, some degree of salinity that is found in the estuary habitat. Now, having said that, if we were to look at the marine habitat first, the marine habitat, uh, let's say we have examples of marine habitats as oceans. Yes, the sea is talking about the oceans. You have things like um, the Pacific Ocean, which is the biggest of all oceans. It's the largest ocean in the world. You have um, the Atlantic Ocean, which is ours. So in Africa, in Nigeria, what we see is the Atlantic Ocean. Then we have the Indian Ocean and so on. Now, all of these oceans are part of the marine habitat. Now, if I were to draw a simple diagram to represent the marine habitat, it would be something like this. Now, looking at this diagram representing the marine habitat, um, we are trying to assume here that we could put the marine habitat in a bowl, use the bowl to represent it. So, looking at this bowl or bath, yes, we have the marine habitat now. This marine habitat is divided into zones. I'll talk about the zones along different directions. Now, coming from here, this part of the earth is called the continental shelf while that other part is called the continental slope so we have the continental shelf and the continental slope now the part of the ocean that is within the shelf this part of the ocean that is along the shelf is referred to as the littoral zone littoral that littoral zone is further divided into three. We call the three regions intertidal, supertidal, and subtidal. So SIS are the three divisions of the littoral zone. Then the part of the ocean that corresponds to this um, continental slope is called the benthic zone. So it means basically the ocean has two zones, the littoral and the benthic. Which of them is up, superficial, littoral? Then benthic is lower, the lower zone. Now the littoral, like I said, goes to a height of about 200 meters. So imagine we're standing in front of an ocean, like on top of an ocean, and we're sinking into the ocean. The first 200 meters we cover is called the littoral zone. Then beyond that, we have what is called the benthic zone. Now that littoral zone receives plenty sunlight. So because it is um, rich in sunlight, richly supplied by sunlight, we call it photic. Then the other zone is called a photic. The photic zone, the benthic zone, does not receive light. So light does not go beyond the first 200 meters, which is in the littoral zone. And then down here we have a photic zone, no light, the zone of darkness. In fact, the lowest part of the a photic zone is so dark that it is named after the underworld. It's believed to be the underworld. You know, in Greek, Hades is the term used to describe the underworld. So we say that the Hadal zone is the zone that corresponds to Hades, the underworld, the dark part of the earth under. 
Then you have supratidal and intertidal, like I mentioned before. Now, there's something we refer to as the tides. Normally, the level of water in the ocean does not stay the same all day long. At some point, it's at the highest level possible. At some other point, it's at the lowest level possible. That lowest level that the water gets to is what we refer to as the low tide. Then the highest level it gets to is what we call the high tide. Now, the region between that low and high tide is called the intertidal zone. So, intertidal here, it's also called um, the euphotic zone. That's a euphotic so the euphotic zone is the intertidal zone, it is the zone between the um, high and low tides. Then above that you have what we call the supratidal, supra above, but it's also called um, the splash zone. So when you have the splash zone, which is in this region now, we refer to it as what? Supratidal. Now we call this splash and um, as a matter of fact, many people regard it as um, you know not being part of the... Um, marine habitat the ocean because it's just about ocean water splashing onto that region at intervals so it's not really part of the um, ocean so that's the supertidal also called splash then there's the subtidal the subtidal is just um, a height of about or a depth rather of about um, 20 meters just below this um, intertidal so so as you come from supertidal you have the intertidal here then the last 20 meters under is called subtidal. The subtidal zone is also called the diphotic zone. Diphotic. So we have euphotic, sorry, splash from top, then euphotic, then diphotic, also called supertidal, intertidal, and subtidal. Now those are the zones of the littoral. Now imagine that we were to walk up across the ocean, assuming that were possible, like take a walk across the ocean. As we approach the ocean, just before we enter the water, we find what we call the shore. So that's the shore before we enter the water. And the first point where we enter the water, what we meet is water that does not go beyond the depth of 200 meters before we reach the floor of the ocean. So the floor of the ocean is right here and this depth is below 200. Just when you get to that depth of 200 and before you go beyond it, the water we have in that early part, the first 200, which also means the water in the continental shelf, is called neritic water. So neritic water is the water of the continental shelf. Then the water of the continental slope is called oceanic water. So it means that as you go from the region where there is water, which we call the pelagic zone, as you go from one end of the pelagic to the other end of the pelagic, which is the ocean itself, you have neritic water first, which is the water of the continental shelf. So if I were to represent this now, I could put a triangle here. Look at that triangle. That triangle represents neritic water. Then going beyond neritic water, so see now, this is the individual from the shore. Neritic water, neritic water then, oceanic water, the person is in the open ocean now. Then all the way on to the end to go through neritic water again before the shore. Alright, so that's neritic water and this is oceanic water. Now, what kind of organisms do we find in this um, marine habitat? The marine habitat contains two major groups of organisms. There are the ones we refer to as the planktons, and then there are some we refer to as nectons. The basic difference between planktons and nectons is some um, degree of movement. The planktons are usually passive. Usually most of them float in the water or get carried around by the water current. They are not active swimmers, unlike the nectons that are active swimmers. Nectons can swim from one region of the water to another and they are usually bigger in size. Now for the planktons, some of them are producer planktons. Plant-like plant plantons as it were. You have things like the algae, 
you have things like um, seaweeds, you have um, the diatoms and so on. Yes, yeah, pyrogyra being an algae is a very good example. All of them are called phytoplanktons. So phytoplanktons are the producer planktons. They are the planktons that um, are essentially plants or plant-like. Then you have the other group of planktons that we refer to as zooplanktons. Zooplanktons will include things like worms, some um, crustaceans like the coffee pots, some others like um, you know some mollusk and so on, some larvae that are found right there in the um, littoral zone, especially. So all of those organisms are referred to as planktons. Usually, the zooplanktons feed on the phytoplanktons. Then for the nectons, they are the bigger organisms in the ocean like um, fish, the whales, um, the other big organisms, you know. They are all examples of nectons. They are active swimmers. Now these nectons, you could find them in the aphotic region and then you find a few of them, very few, in the photic region. Now having mentioned those, I'd like to mention here that the organisms that we find in this um, marine habitat have different challenges. One major challenge they have, especially in the aphotic region, is the fact that there is no light in that region. They have to adapt to the absence of light. For example, in the aphotic region, you don't find plants. Why don't we find plants there? Plants need light to photosynthesize. So essentially, plants are found in the photic region, but in the aphotic, no plants. So you see that's part of the problems, the challenges now. Then the animals you have there, what about food? Well, they get their food from um, the photic region. When organisms in the photic region die, many of them fall down, you know, more like the sediment, fall into the benthic zone, the aphotic region, and there the organisms can eat them, which of course makes them detritus feeders. If you remember detritus from our video on um, nutrition, then again, the organisms that are in the littoral zone have a separate problem. And the major problems they have there would include problems with um, the waves and the tides, you understand, getting washed off, but getting dislodged from that place. Because of course, an organism here, if dislodged or if washed into the open ocean, may not be able to cook, may end up dying and serve as food for organisms in this other region. So what do we find? The organisms in the littoral zone have different adaptations for survival. Some of them are able to, um, tell you when the shore is rocky, some of them are able to hold on to the shore. Like you have um, the barnacles, they become cemented to the shore. You have um, plants like sagasum that have um, hold fast, through which they could hold on to the shore and not get dislodged easily. Some forms of crabs are able to run back into their shells. You understand these are adaptations that they have organisms that are in the splash zone which is part of the littoral actually those ones you see things like um, the ability to withstand drought so they are they are more like adapted for life in water as well as on land so they are not typically um, marine organisms like we said after all the splash zone is not really considered to be part of the ocean then of course you also have um, the problem of tide of course, organisms that are in the intertidal zone, when the water level drops, then they stand the risk of desiccation, they stand the risk of getting dried up. All right? So all of those are challenges they have, and there are different ways that they are able to adapt to those challenges, but I'll not like to go into unnecessary details. Now, beyond the, um, aqua, uh, the um, marine habitat, we said before that we have the estuarine and we have the freshwater. Now for the estuarine habitat, we mentioned already that estuarine water is brackish water. The water in an estuary is like a mixture of the water in the marine habitat and the water in the freshwater habitat. Little wonder many say that the estuary is where the river meets the sea. So in the estuarine habitat, we could have everything being like a mixture. The organisms you find here, yes, some of them are from here, some are from there. The water you find here yeah, is a mixture of the two. So it's like you understand this, you understand that, and then put together what you get from both to see what the estuary is like, basically. Now, having spoken about the um, marine habitat, I'd like to move on to talk about the uh, freshwater habitat after this break. Welcome back.
Now looking at freshwater habitats, we said previously that the basic difference between this type of habitat and uh, the marine habitat is salt content. And remember that we said in between we have what we call the estuary. Now for the freshwater habitat, there can be two types of it. There is freshwater habitat where the water is standing, not flowing. So we say the water is standing or the water is static. Right? And we say that in that case we have what we refer to as lotic, oh sorry, lentic, this lentic. So where the water is standing, we say the water is lentic, and that can include things like um, ponds and lakes. So ponds and lakes contain what we call lentic water, standing water. Then we have flowing water. In the case where the water is flowing, we say that the freshwater habitat is lotic. And um, that could include things like rivers and streams. So rivers and streams are different from ponds and lakes in that the water in the river is flowing, whereas the water in the lake is standing, doesn't flow. Now, it means that organisms that are found in rivers would have the challenge of being washed away. They'll have to fight against getting washed away. But we'll talk about all of that in a moment. Coming back to standing water, lentic water, the idea is, in fact, whether lentic or lotic, in the freshwater habitat, we still have those regions we mentioned for the marine habitat, which are things like um, the littoral zone, the benthic zone, you remember all of that, we talked about um, the main body of the water, photic, aphotic, yes, you have all of them present here. Then also, the organisms that we saw in the marine habitats, they repeat themselves here, in that you have um, the... Uh, Planktons and the nectons, phytoplankton, zooplankton, you know, the whole story, same way it was told earlier. Just that the organisms that you find in this freshwater habitat are more adapted to things like the low salt concentration, because in a marine habitat the salt concentration is high and the organisms they are able to withstand it. But the organisms in this case are specially designed to withstand the low salt concentration that is found in the water. Now, examples of organisms you will find in freshwater habitats, especially in lakes, would include things like um, the annelids. You have annelids there. You have um, different crustaceans. Yes, there are crustaceans present. There are a few mollusks present. Then you have larvae of some organisms like um, frogs and toads. We know that frogs and toads are amphibians, and when they are to reproduce, yes, they return to the water, lay their eggs, and return to um, land. So when their eggs hatch, of course, we know we have the tadpoles. Tadpoles do not grow in marine habitats. Instead, they are adapted for survival in freshwater habitats. So tadpoles are also there. Then you have birds, too, that come to look for these larvae, look for annelids, look for crustaceans and mollusks to feed on. So they also come to um, lentic or standing water. But in um, the case of um, lotic water, where the water flows, such as in rivers, you have organisms, like I said, that struggle to survive. But as a matter of fact, the water in the river could um, vary in speed. Different rivers flow at different rates. Some could be so slow that they resemble the lakes. And for such waters, the plants that survive in lakes, the animals that survive in lakes can also survive in such rivers. But for fast-flowing rivers, you could have organisms that begin to have adaptations, like some fish will have the ability to jump over rapids, some others have the ability to swim against the water current, so that they don't get washed away. You have um, larvae that are able to anchor, like um, we talk about the um, water snail, the water snail is able to anchor, hold on to vegetation in water. You remember the role of the water snail in the transmission of um, schistosomiasis. So schistosomiasis is transmitted, as we are well aware, um, carries out parts of its um, life cycle in a secondary host, which is the water snail. And this water snail, being in water in fast flowing rivers, is able to survive, is able to remain in the water because it can anchor. So for the freshwater um, 
habitat, there's not so much to say. Just remember the basic difference, um, salt concentration, as what differentiates it from the marine habitat. Because as we discussed the marine, the basic um, features of aquatic habitats had already been mentioned. But at this point, it may be important to add that marshes and swamps, if you remember we saw this in the first video, that marshes and swamps are components of, um, what do you call this now, the wetlands. You remember that? We talked about the wetlands. We actually classified them as terrestrial, but for a truth, some other persons consider them aquatic. Aquatic because they are not just land with small amounts of water. As a matter of fact, some of them can be so big that they even resemble the lakes or the ponds, especially. So, in some contexts, they, the, they are considered components of the aquatic habitat, not the terrestrial. So, for that reason, I'll say a word on them as though they are the link between the aquatic and the terrestrial habitat. So ultimately, by the time I'm done with this, I'll take a look at the terrestrial habitats. So for marshes and swamps, basically, we say that they are like the aquatic habitat, just that they have a large population of plants in them, unlike these ones. They have plenty of plants, especially the higher plants. The plants you see in um, freshwater habitats, marine habitats, they are usually lower plants, the um, microscopic plants, not bigger plants per se. But here you have the more advanced plants, the grasses, the trees. Now basically, marshes differ from swamps in that marshes contain mainly grasses as their vegetation, whereas swamps contain trees. Now the swamps, on the other hand, do not contain, um, okay, basically they have trees, and then these swamps, some of them are regarded as forests. Yes, we talk about the mangrove swamps, for example. Those mangrove swamps are forests, they have plenty of trees, they also have other plants like the white and the red mangroves. We know of the white mangrove, we know of the red mangrove as examples of um, plants that are found in the swamps. In the marshes, you find different species of grasses. All of these are inside the water. Then the water that you find in marshes or swamps, interestingly, could be fresh water, could be brackish water, or could be salt water. So it means we have salt water marshes, we have uh, brackish water marshes, and we have fresh water marshes. Then the organisms that you find in marshes, they are similar to the organisms that you find in other aquatic animals. You could have them as planktons, nectons. You have different kinds of organisms. I mean, the animals and plant um, that you find there. But well, those ones do not really constitute the majority. That's why we said that they are mainly made up of higher plants. But that does not mean that the lower organisms are not present in marshes or in swamps. Uh, well, at this level, because we don't lay much emphasis on the details of this, I'll let it rest at that. Then I'll spend the remainder of my time in the next video talking about 